House of the Dragon, the Game of Thrones prequel spin-off adapted from George R. R. Martin's Fire and Blood, was a massive success with its debut season in 2022, bringing to life an abundance of characters from House Targaryen, delivering a stellar season of TV that not only showed extreme levels of quality worthy of its predecessor, but also showed that despite the efforts of season 8 of Game of Thrones, this franchise could still work. It was such a success that the hype for its second season reached incredible heights. After the season 1 finale left on the cliffhanger of Rhaenyra finding out her son was just killed, igniting what would be a bloody and brutal civil war between two rivaling factions of House Targaryen, needless to say, people were pretty hyped for what was going to come next. Well, season 2 has finished its run, and it's been extremely polarizing, to say the least. Many people praising Season 2 as a great continuation from the excellent start in Season 1, but many people have also expressed their disdain for Season 2 for a variety of reasons. Some of those reasons more credible than others, but we'll get to that. I think the fairest criticism of Season 2 overall is that it's a severely stretched out season and essentially is just more build up for the main conflicts of this story. Despite the fact there are a lot of things it gets right, by this show's own high standards, there are a few letdowns in certain areas. So in this video, we are going to dive deep into Season 2 of House of the Dragon. Where did it go right? Where did it go wrong? And all things in between. So let's take a deep dive look into Season 2 of House of the Dragon. So, safe to say, I really enjoyed the first season of House of the Dragon. As a massive Game of Thrones fan and a Song of Ice and Fire fan, I was really happy to see Westeros return to the small screen and actually be good. Especially given how things ended with Game of Thrones. So, safe to say, I was extremely excited for Season 2 of House of the Dragon. It was easily my most anticipated show of the year, and I have to say, especially in the first half of the season, I was absolutely loving what this show was cooking up. That did change toward the end of the season, but we'll of course get to that. The first few episodes of season two were incredibly character driven, and I still would say are the best episodes of the season. We pick up almost immediately after the events of season one. Rhaenyra heads to Storm's End to seek closure over the death of her son, which was a great scene. We also see in these moments, Daemon confront Rhaenys over the fact she spared the Greens in season one, and that if she didn't, the war would be over and Luke would still be alive. Which is a line that I think goes under the radar quite a bit when her death comes around in the Battle of Rook's Rest. There really were a lot of great subtle moments in these early episodes that I only really picked up on when re-watching as well. Such as Otto Hightower knowing straight away that Alicent and Cole were doing the dirty. There was never a line said, it was just a look from Otto. And it's a subtle show don't tell moment that I appreciate. But the main thing that these early episodes of season 2 of House of the Dragon did, and to be honest this season as a whole did, that really impressed me was it made me like Aegon, which after the first season I never thought would be possible. But I think Aegon is one of the richest characters in this show, and I think Tom Glyn Carney deserves a lot of praise for writing the line of entitled and sympathetic. Is Aegon a piece of shit? Yeah. He's done terrible things that shouldn't be forgiven, but you also completely understand why he turned out the way he did. Of course, Viserys named Rhaenyra his heir, and despite Aegon being born, he never changed his mind and renamed him heir. So Aegon was forced to grow up thinking that his father didn't like him. He was, by what would be conventional rights, the heir to the Iron Throne, but was never named as such. The neglect he felt from that distance from Viserys and his traditionally rightful claim led him down a path of self-destruction, where he was largely ignored and looked down on by both his father and mother. So when he gets the attention he's lacked his entire life at the end of Season 1, he relishes it, which carries over into Season 2 when he addresses the common folk. Aegon actually wants to be a good king, he wants to help these people, as these are the only people that have ever paid any real attention to him. It's only Otto that stands in the way of him doing so, as he was never taught by Viserys on how to rule. That's why I think this scene in the throne room is one of the best in the show, and elevated Aegon as a character significantly. Of course, throw in the fact that despite him wanting to be a good ruler, when he's actually in a position of importance, he's essentially told by everyone around him to do nothing, and is largely ignored by the Green Council, which includes his own mother and even his brother. He's forced to deal with that all while seeking revenge for the death of his son, 
the fact Aegon brings young Jaehaerys into the War Council was actually a really nice detail. Now, is this scene in place so we establish young Jaehaerys so we know who it is that Blood and Cheese are killing? Yes. But there's more to this scene than just that. He's doing what Viserys never did with him. He clearly wants to be a good father and to teach his son what he was never taught growing up to avoid Jaehaerys turning into the broken shell of a person that Aegon was. And when he loses Jaehaerys through blood and cheese, he goes mad wanting revenge. But again, his pleads fall on deaf ears as he's still largely ignored by the likes of Otto, who, let's be honest, is the one doing the ruling. It's somewhat reminiscent of Tywin and Joffrey, and I appreciate that. Otto thought he could control Aegon, but when he comes to realize that Aegon and Cole have sent Sir Arik to Dragonstone to attempt to assassinate Rhaenyra as well as hang the rat catchers, he realizes that Aegon's impetulance and desire to be respected makes him a complete moron. We see in this moment Otto questioning everything he's done up until this point to get Aegon on the throne. Otto weaponizes the tragedy of Jaehaerys' death by allowing the common folk to see the work of what they frame as Rhaenyra's work, only for Aegon to completely undo it behind his back by hanging the rat catchers. You've also got Laris attempting to manipulate Aegon against Otto in this time, and it works as it leads to Aegon dismissing Otto as Hand of the King. Aegon and Otto's dynamic is largely why I absolutely love these first few episodes, and I wish we just got more of it. And Otto's absence from the rest of the season really, really did hurt this season overall, if I'm honest. There's also a scene in episode 2 where Aegon is crying, largely due to the death of his son, but also that feeling he's had his entire life of being neglected despite his station hasn't really gone away even now that he is king. Alicent in this moment doesn't comfort Aegon, which I found to be an interesting parallel, as when Rhaenyra is faced with her son in tears, she throws Judy aside to hear his message and embraces him, highlighting the difference between Rhaenyra and Alicent. Alicent's treatment of Aegon is why he eventually snaps in a drunken fury and takes some fire to Rook's rest. Aegon is then critically injured by Aemond and Vhagar, crippling him for life. And it's here we see Laris swoop in to get Aegon ready to leave King's Landing, as Laris knows the dynamic of the war has changed dramatically with the Dragon Seeds, and Aegon is now an obstacle for Aemond. I really liked this, not just for Aegon's character, but mainly for Laris. He's trying to teach Aegon that the fact he's crippled and deformed now means people will underestimate him, and that's his new advantage. It tells you a lot about where Aegon is heading as a character, but it also tells you a lot about how Laris got to the position that he's in. I thought this was absolutely excellent, and although we didn't get much of Laris this season, what we did get I think was very effective. I overall just didn't expect Aegon to be one of my favorite parts of this season, but here we are. I think it would be extremely fair to say that the Greens carried Season 2, which is a bit of a problem when the show is written in a way where the Blacks are clearly portrayed as the good guys. I know some people are going to say, well, the Blacks ordered the murder of a child. There are no good guys. And yeah, you're right. There are no good guys in this war. That's kind of the point. But in terms of the context of this show, that was Damon, who is extremely self-motivated still at the start of this season, which is the point of his entire arc here. He goes from self-motivated loyalty to pure loyalty. Remember, Damon has the name The Rogue Prince for a reason. Regardless of blood and cheese, the show is clearly portraying the Blacks as the good guys despite Damon being there. And I've got to say, the Blacks were the least interesting part of this season. The Greens did carry. Aemond only had 22 minutes of screen time in the entire freaking season, but every single scene you and Mitchell made it count. And I've got to say, Aemond is really interesting here. I've seen a lot of people say he's just evil because evil, which I just completely fundamentally disagree with on every single level. We see that he does feel bad for what happened to Luke at the end of season one, but majority of the time he simply just won't let his guard down in front of almost anyone. He was a bullied child and then he gained the greatest power in the realm. He also became a formidable fighter and clearly wants to relish in his newfound power. So the second it gets questioned, he loses his temper. And this is also why he welcomes the challenge of Damon. He even says in the show that he's basically honored that Damon seeks him as a challenge. Aemond is angry and enjoys being feared despite his severe insecurities. That's why I love the scene where Helena, the purest and most innocent character on this show, absolutely destroys Aemond. He has this facade he's created for himself, but underneath it is still that angry bullied child. 
We see him relish in his ego being stroked by the likes of Cole and Otto when he says that him and Vega are the single greatest power in the realm. But when characters see past Aemon's facade, such as Aegon in the brothel scene, Alicent when he confronts Helena, and Helena spelling out to Aemon how insignificant he really is, these are the moments that we see that facade slip. I also love how they play with Aemon wanting to remove Aegon from the equation to become the Prince Regent. It harkens back to Season 1, where Aegon says Aemon should be king. We clearly see through Ewan Mitchell's performance that there is more bubbling under the surface for him and we get to see that start to pay off in Season 2. The scenes where Aemond humiliates Aegon in the Green Council scenes are also great. Aemond switching to Valyrian in front of the Council knowing that Aegon's Valyrian sucks was an absolute power move. Between Otto, Aegon, and Aemond, the Greens are the reason to watch this show heading into Season 3. I absolutely love all three of these characters. Now, although the Greens undoubtedly stole the show this season, the Blacks did have some excellent moments on their side too, to be fair. Although Rhaenyra was confined to Dragonstone for majority of the show, we did get some greatness here. The one that sticks out for me is Rhaenyra and Daemon's fight after she finds out that Daemon ordered the killing of Aemon behind her back, which of course resulted in young Jaehaerys' death. The way this scene is shot where Rhaenyra comes to realize that Daemon has just done Daemon things is absolutely hilarious. I love this. And it leads into Rhaenyra saying everything Daemon doesn't want to hear, but we as the viewer know to be true. Daemon never really got over Viserys overlooking him as heir. Daemon says it's because Viserys feared him, but in reality, he just couldn't trust him. Daemon has vicariously been living his robbed station through Rhaenyra, which is really, really interesting. And it's clear that Rhaenyra knows this, which infuriates Daemon, as he sets off to Harrenhal to recruit houses in the Riverlands. But considering Rhaenyra and Daemon's fight, he starts to question whether or not he should be raising those houses' banners under his name. His entire arc this season is finally putting his selfishness aside to fully support his queen for real and to play his part in this war. Daemon needs to accept that he isn't the player of the game of chess, he's just a pawn on the board, and by the end of the season, we see him understand that. Daemon's character actually comes a long way this season, it's just a shame how it happened, but we'll get to that in part 2 of the video. I also think the dragon seeds were handled extremely well this season. Hugh, Ulf, and Adam all claim their dragons, and it was really funny hearing people complain about us, and I quote, wasting time with these characters in the early episodes of the season. But obviously, as a book reader, I could kind of sit back and watch these people eat their own words in real time once they claimed their dragons and became an integral part of this war. And these characters still are more important than you know even by the end of season 2. So to all the people that were complaining that we were spending time with these characters and it was just wasting time, relax. It's a TV show. These things play out over time. It's there for a reason. Now, I have seen a lot of lore junkies complain about the fact that Sea Smoke claimed Adam and not the other way around, as it possibly implies that Lainor is dead, but... I don't really see that as a problem. We realistically don't know a whole lot about the Dragon Rider Bond and it's going to be explained in future A Song of Ice and Fire books if George ever finishes them. But I really like the speculation surrounding why Sea Smoke claimed Adam. Is it because Lainor is really far away? Is it because Sea Smoke just feels abandoned? Is it because Lainor is dead? Who knows? But the theorizing is fun. But let's talk about the action. The action side of Season 2 was obviously a massive talking point. Some notable moments of action were the slaughter of the Dragon Seeds and Sir Eric and Sir Eric's fight on Dragonstone. And I have to give props to the showrunners here. They depicted Sir Eric and Sir Eric's fight very well and I love the decision to edit the fight so you didn't know who was who. It capped off an excellent episode. And of course, seeing Papa Vermithor chow down on dragon seeds was incredibly entertaining. But Rook's Rest sits as one of the highest rated Game of Thrones episodes ever, and rightly so. Rook's Rest is something that I was looking forward to ever since I read the book. It's the first time we were going to really get our first good look at multiple dragons going head to head. We did get Arax and Vagar in Season 1, but that wasn't really a fight. That was kind of just an escape mission, to be honest but they definitely pulled it off with the Battle of Rook's Rest. This was one of the most well-shot episodes of the season with some incredible cinematography. Like, just look at this shot, man. This is great. 
people are really saying this season's trash i just i look at this and i'm like how Melis and Rhaenys' death was heartbreaking and to be honest I think they did it better than it was described in the book. The look Melis and Rhaenys share as they both know it's over is heartbreaking. Now I've seen a lot of people complain about Rhaenys turning back after Sunfire was taken out when she easily could have escaped but I think most of those people don't understand what a dragon rider's death means to them. Remember Lena in season 1? Instead of dying during childbirth on her bed, she wanted to go out like a dragon rider and ordered Vagar to kill her. So not only does she desire a dragon rider's death, but she clearly holds some level of guilt for not ending the greens in season 1, which harkens back to the line from Daemon in episode 1. Rhaenys had no response to Daemon for this. Her turning back to fight Vagar, knowing it would likely end in her death, was the response. I also love how they showed us the ground level carnage of a dragon battle and Cole is the vessel we experience this. Cole realizes in this moment what dragon warfare looks like and we see his entire demeanor change for the rest of the season which leads into a great monologue to Gwen Hightower in the finale. He talks about how all endeavors, all the tactics they deploy, Men are dust beneath dragon's feet and death is inevitable, which is pretty bleak, but it goes to show you how bad dragon warfare can be. All in all, there is a lot to love in season 2 of House of the Dragon, and I think a lot of people do understand that. To act like this season is some kind of abomination when there's so much objective quality around the show's flaws is just insane to me. But flaws, the show does have, so let's talk about those. So even though I overall really enjoyed this season, there are problems here that weren't really there in season 1. There was a lot of departure from the books which a lot of people are using as ammo as to why this season is the second coming of season 8 of Game of Thrones because people are insane. But to be honest, book departures was never the problem here. I think a lot of people forget that Fire and Blood is told from multiple perspectives with biases and contradictions literally riddled throughout. So it's virtually impossible to adapt everything and have it work for screen. Even when a series is easily adaptable, which Fire and Blood is certainly not, it's still pretty much impossible to adapt it 100% faithfully because the mediums are simply different. Book purists who get up in arms the second something changes just makes me cringe to be honest. And I say that as a book reader. If you want the book, go and read the damn book. Was I upset because we didn't get more of Jason, Craig and Stark? Yeah. Sure, but you know what? I got over it. I'm not about to go online and say the show's on par with season 8 of Game of Thrones because they left out a bunch of stuff with Jason Cregan. Like, go read the book. That's my little book reader rant over though. I had to get that off my chest. I've been sitting on that one all season. Anyway, I have issues with season 2 and I think the biggest issue I have is the pacing of this season. Whilst I enjoyed every episode in some way, and I don't think there was any bad episodes despite the review bombing would have you believe, there were certain parts of the show that were dragging their feet. Most of it came from the Blacks. Rhaenyra was, as I said earlier, essentially confined to Dragonstone for most of the season, having the same conversations with the same people over the same topic episode after episode. Yes, there were integral scenes within those, absolutely, but there was undoubtedly an issue with the pacing of her time on Dragonstone. Same goes with Damon in Harrenhal, which has become the biggest punching bag for the negatives of Season 2. Was it crucial for Damon's arc? Yes, but it was the same formula every episode. Damon wrestles with the idea of him being king, he trips balls, has a dream sequence that develops the character along, and then wakes up confused and frustrated. Now, this is fine, but it happens like five times. Even though I don't like how it happened, I love the arc that Damon actually went on this season and I love how they portrayed Harrenhal, which does not get enough credit by the way. They did a great job. The final vision with Damon, which showed the White Walkers and Daenerys was the topic of a lot of controversy, mainly because the White Walker looked kind of weird, but it was mainly because of the way they shot it. The behind the scenes photos show the White Walker looked great. It was just a really weird shot choice. I don't know what lens they used, but it definitely did the character no favors. But the amount of people comparing this guy to the Night King is insane. People actually thought they were trying to say that this was the Night King. Like, my brother in Christ, no wonder the discourse of this show was overblown when people can't even piece together that this is not the freaking Night King. 
But anyway, Damon's scenes in Harrenhal undeniably halted the pacing of the show. And I feel for Caraxes, man. My guy just had to sit in the Harrenhal parking lot whilst Damon tripped balls all season. Justice for Caraxes. Now, as for characters like Coralus, he kind of just exists this season. We start off with some good scenes between him and Rhaenys, and when he loses her, he gets a couple scenes of interest. We see him wrestle with the idea that he's basically lost everyone, Lainor, Lena, Vaymond, Rhaenys, and even his heir to Driftmark, which makes him want to rekindle with the bastards he's ignored, and it was great to see Alan throw it back in his face. I really like Coralus as he's a flawed character and played by a great actor, but I definitely felt like his character was in limbo for large sections of this season. He will be important going forward, make no mistake, and I'm looking forward to seeing more from him. But I can't lie, season 2 I was a little disappointed by him. The final issue I had on the side of the Blacks was regarding Reyna in the Veil. This wasn't awful by any means, but again, it hindered the pacing of the show. In the finale alone, we cut to Reyna multiple times just running across the veil to try and find Sheepstealer, which I feel like the Hill Tribes would have found her first, but that's a nerdy ass nitpick on my end, I'll admit. But this led to the confirmation that Reyna will claim Sheepstealer, which means Nettles probably isn't in the show, at least as we know of her in the book. Now, I assume they've done this for a reason, and we obviously haven't seen the full scope of that reason yet, so I'm not about to be one of those people that say, oh, Nettles isn't riding Sheepstealer, 1 out of 10, trash, this show sucks, like some people have. I assume Nettles will have a part to play in some capacity anyway later in the show, but just won't be riding Sheepstealer. But moving over to the Greens side of the negatives of Season 2. There aren't anywhere near as many, but I've seen a lot of people complain about Alicent this season, and to be honest, I think the way Season 2 was marketed is a big part of the reason as to why. They've marketed this show heavily as Blacks vs Greens, Rhaenyra vs Alicent, but Alicent is largely a bystander in this war. A lot of this story is about her sitting back reaping what she sowed. But the show insists on having this Rhaenyra vs Alicent dynamic, therefore they had to force situations where Alicent and Rhaenyra came face to face, despite the fact it logistically doesn't really make sense. Rhaenyra going to King's Landing under the connections of Missaria was something that I could make my peace with as it did deliver a really great scene between the two characters that was undoubtedly important for the clarity side of this war, but the second time it happened with Alicent going to Dragonstone in the finale, I was a little confused. This scene doesn't need to exist, to be honest. One, it's contrived to have these two characters together again. But two, it's kind of for nothing, at least for now, because we know Aegon has fled King's Landing anyway. And the idea of this scene was Alicent making a sacrifice of a son for a son to reap what she sowed by starting this conflict. But again, Laris got Aegon out of King's Landing, so obviously Rhaenyra is going to have Alicent's ass whooped anyway. Which again, as a book reader, does make sense, but we didn't need this scene to get there. Now, speaking of logistics in Season 2, one of my biggest problems with the later Game of Thrones seasons was everybody unlocked fast travel. What was normally a season-long trip across Westeros became a jump cut in later seasons. Now I can make my peace with this in House of the Dragon because most of the characters doing this traveling do have dragons and can obviously fly around Westeros significantly faster. But we do see Rhaenyra, Alicent, Sir Arik and the Dragon Seeds go from King's Landing to Dragonstone and vice versa. And I've seen a lot of people complain about this too, but it is worth noting that Dragonstone and King's Landing are actually really close. But I think the show does a poor job in keeping you updated on how much time has passed with this travel. It's by no means as bad as season 7 and 8 of Game of Thrones where characters literally teleport without care or reason. But it is worth noting, seeing characters teleport around when the time it took to do so is kept vague is jarring as a Game of Thrones fan. But my final issue with season 2 is the finale. Episode 8 of this season is a good episode, but it is a terrible season finale. Watching this season through, it felt like we were building toward A, the Battle of the Gullet, or they were going to swap the events around and King's Landing was going to come into play. If you know, you know. But they've gone and saved both for season 3, which rubs me the wrong way because they cut two episodes out of this season. These two episodes would have fit perfectly where we have the Battle of the Gullet in Episode 9, traditionally a huge episode for Game of Thrones, 
and then the characters lick their wounds and we end on a cliffhanger for what's to come in the finale. But instead, we got none of that and just end on a season 3 trailer after the climax of the season comes in episode 4. Structurally, this season is just strange. Now look, I can sit there and happily watch these characters just talk with one another with no dragons in sight and be perfectly satisfied. I love these characters, I love this world, and when the dialogue is good, man is it good. But most people are here for dragons, and if they don't get it, they're gonna kick and stomp their feet, and I think we've seen that a lot with season 2. So they kind of just walked into that one over at HBO. Now, I think people that have a balanced take on season two as slow and unnecessarily stretched out are totally justified, but I have seen a lot of people complain about this show because they didn't get the non-stop action they wanted. I said this in my Game of Thrones video, but a lot of people these days have this notion in their head that what made Game of Thrones so great was the big battles and the dragons, when in reality, that just was never the case at all. In fact, it was actually literally the complete opposite. We didn't have a major battle until the end of season 2, when the show ramped up the action significantly in later seasons, the writing quality dropped through the floor. The political drama that Game of Thrones was devolved into an action fantasy show. And a lot of people assume that's what Game of Thrones was, action fantasy. So with House of the Dragon, if they're not getting the non-stop stimulation akin to season 7 of Game of Thrones, it's boring to them. Now granted, we do live in a time where people's attention spans are at an all-time low, which certainly doesn't help. But this just adds to the bizarre nature of Season 2 of House of the Dragon, choosing to stretch it out and make it slower, which clearly doesn't cater to, unfortunately, a large portion of the audience. So the amount of hate this show got for simply being slow was completely overblown, which leads me on to the backlash of Season 2. So I've seen a lot of people praise season two as a brilliant continuation for this story, slowly building up certain story and character elements. So when we do arrive at the insane conflicts, it's going to be as satisfying as can be. And overall, people are just praising the fact that this show isn't afraid to take its time. But to counter that, there are people who are saying that season two is worse than season seven and eight of Game of Thrones because, well, crazy people exist. But I think mainly it's because of a certain phenomenon. We live in a time where movies, games, and shows have to be a 1 out of 10 disaster or a 10 out of 10 masterpiece, with no room for balanced, nuanced discussion in between, which I am seeing with the discourse surrounding this show. This is something that you see a fair bit with video games specifically. The Last of Us Part 2 is a great example. A lot of people tend to think that game is a 10 out of 10 masterpiece and the best game they've ever played, Others say it's a 1 out of 10 dumpster fire with no redeeming qualities at all. It's one extreme or the other. And if you've engaged in any kind of online discourse surrounding that game, you will know that there is basically no room for balanced discussion. You've got to be in the 10 out of 10 camp or the 1 out of 10 camp. And even if you have a balanced take on it, both camps will group you into the opposing extreme. It's incredibly toxic both ways. And you know, I thought this was just a phenomenon that was just limited to the gaming side of entertainment, but I'm starting to see it a lot here with season two of House of the Dragon. If you say you like the show, you're shilling out. And if you have criticism, you're hate watching. Both sides are as bad as each other because the conversation is more nuanced than that. This season, realistically, is more like a strong 7 out of 10, but online discourse would have you believe it's a 1 out of 10 because the idea of a 7 out of 10 is quickly becoming lost amongst online fandom. Again, we live in a time of extremes, which is really frustrating. Like, I get that you might have thought this season was slow, and I agree with you, don't forget that. But the amount of vitriol this season created because of the smallest things, it's like Star Wars level of online toxic discourse. The way people carried on with this season was unbelievable. Like, people are comparing Ryan Condal to Benioff and Weiss because Damon spent a little too long in Harren Hall. People are saying House of the Dragon Season 2 is as bad as Season 8 of Game of Thrones because they had Alicent go for a walk in a forest. People are saying this show is the worst in history because we only got a couple action set pieces. Like, this show didn't do anything anywhere near as bad as the online discourse would have you believe. And again, I say that as someone who has issues with this season. 
Was it a slow season and basically just moving the chess pieces for season three? Yeah, but that doesn't make it the second coming of season eight of Game of Thrones like many people would have you believe. I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty ashamed to be a part of this fandom with some of the stuff I was reading regarding this season. It did kind of start to make sense when Kristen Cole's actor Fabian Frankel had to basically limit his Instagram comments because knuckle dragging morons can't tell the difference between an actor and a character. And it's people with that level of intelligence that tend to be the loudest on the internet. Look, I don't think season two is as good as season one, both from a writing standpoint, but also a pacing and decision making standpoint by the showrunners. But I also think those claiming this season was this bona fide disaster on par with the season eight of Game of Thrones is just absolutely ridiculous and shouldn't even be taken seriously. The fact of the matter is this season gets a whole lot right, but it does stumble along the way. And to be honest, I think the biggest issue with this season was its structure because it is very clear that HBO have stepped in and said, stretch this thing out. We ended Game of Thrones prematurely. We're not ending this one prematurely. Season one had 10 episodes. It had two five episode blocks with the younger and older actors, and it felt complete. Season two went to an eight episode format and ended when it was really just getting started, leaving you to wonder why weren't those final two episodes there? It would have felt like an incredibly well-rounded season if the Battle of the Gullet was that big penultimate episode set piece that we'd been building toward. So instead, you opt to finish on a finale that, as I said earlier, was a good episode, but a bad finale. Just a 60 minute long trailer for the third season. Like, it's just weird. I understand the frustration behind this, I really do, because now we have to wait another two years, which does suck, but again, the amount of hate this season generated gave me season 8 flashbacks. Yet what I was seeing on screen simply wasn't worthy of that level of discourse, not even close. So, season 2 of House of the Dragon. It's not the home run that I was hoping for, but it's certainly not the travesty that the internet would have you believe. It still manages to deliver complex characters, incredible set pieces, although few and far between, and political moves that made Game of Thrones such a hit in the first place. It's got some bumps along the way, make no mistake, but season two feels like the season that is going to walk so the remaining two seasons can sprint full steam ahead into some of the most insane carnage we've seen in Westeros. Season three of House of the Dragon is going to be absolutely massive and it can't come soon enough.